Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. This is a recorded module. And as we progress through the slides, you will have access to our contact information. So please feel free to contact any of us if you have questions or any sort of follow up when you get through this presentation, we'd love to connect with you. So hopefully you're here to learn more about writing compliant and measurable goals specifically avoiding outcome goals. That's what this, this focus is going to be. And if we were live, I would ask you to take a look at this and drop in the chat box any words that sort of jump out to you. This is a nice visual that just really speaks to the teamwork. And we really do believe in teamwork. We really are here to support you. So please feel free to uh, just take a moment and look at this slide and see if there's anything that jumps out at you. And this is our team. My name is Colette Sullivan. I am the Federal Programs Coordinator, and I am so lucky that I get to work with Leora, Jennifer, Carly, and Julie. And as I mentioned, here's our contact information. So when you get through this presentation, please feel free to reach out to any of us if there's anything that we can clarify for you. As part of all of our professional development opportunities, we like to share a link to our procedural manual. The procedural manual is a fantastic resource that was developed by the IEP committee, and it goes into a lot of really great and helpful detail about compliant IEP development. We also like to share a link to the Maine Unified Special Education Regulations, or MUSER. That is where all of the regulations come from, and we pull a lot of our PD from here as well. So we like to provide you with this in case you want to dig a little deeper. All right, avoiding outcome-based goals. That's what this focus will be today. And we think about outcomes as those age-appropriate expectations, those expectations that we have for all students. What are the things that we expect and want all students to master? So when you as a team, as a member of your team are considering this, we would ask you to really think about skill deficits, okay? So again, outcomes are those age appropriate expectations. So think about why can't the student reach those expectations and work with your team and really review evaluations, any data that you may have, observations or other relevant information that might help you figure this piece out. Those skills are really important because those are the things that will facilitate, hopefully, a change in an outcome and move the student closer to that piece. I mentioned the procedural manual as being a very useful uh, tool. And on page 26 of our procedural manual, you will see a lot more information about this topic. All right, so think about it like this. Under academic, we have these broad headers, right? We've got reading, writing, listening, speaking, and mathematical problem solving. Those are those broad components that all of your academic programming will fall under. But if we have a student who is struggling with reading, for example, we would not write a goal that says student will improve reading, right? Because we know that to be far too broad. It's just too large. It encompasses too many skills. So what we would want to look for are those distinctly measurable and persistent gaps that are interfering with that child's ability to be on grade level with reading. And we've included some examples here. Now, again, if we were live, I would ask you to look at this and tell me if we missed any, because I know that we have. This is not intended to encompass every skill. It's just intended to give you in some examples. So under reading, the skill deficits for a student who cannot read on grade level might be decoding, encoding, fluency, comprehension, sight words, phonemic awareness, vocabulary, or as I mentioned, several others, right? And we look at that in the same way as we would, you know, for writing, listening, speaking, and mathematical problem solving. So you're going to really focus on the skills. And functional is the same way. We have the broad headings. We have the cognitive, communicative, motor, adaptive, social, emotional, and sensory. 
And then as we did with academic, we've broken down and given you some examples that might fall under each, again, knowing that there are many others. So if I were to look at adaptive, for example, the distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps that I might see under adaptive could be toileting, hand washing, cooking, eating, dressing, or many others. So what are the outcomes? What are the skill deficits that interfere with that child's ability to get there? And if we focus on that, what are we going to teach them? So think again, if you know what the outcome is, that age appropriate expectation, dig into those skill deficits, right? Because those are what you are going to teach the student that will facilitate an improvement in that age appropriate expectation. So, Academic outcome-based goals could be reading on grade level, math skills on grade level, writing on grade level, but those are too broad. So let's look at Eli. Eli is in the first grade and he's been identified with an SLD in reading. There are evaluations to support this and they are documented in section 4A. His IEP team also identified the following skill deficits and a how statement in section 4C, which looks like this. So based on that information, we know that Eli has skill deficits in fluent letter identification, and that those skill gaps will absolutely impact his ability to participate in liter literacy activities with his same age peers, right? So we got that information through evaluations, through observations. Again, you worked with your team to figure that out. So because he has this very specific skill deficit, he's unable to reach that age appropriate expectation of reading at the first grade level. So we're going to write a goal, not around reaching the, grade of the age appropriate expectation of reading, but we're going to write the goal around letter ID. So we have our present level. We know that Eli can expressively identify 17 of the 26 alphabet letters. So to align to that present level, we've written this goal. By 12-5, 2023, given SDI, Eli will expressively ID all 26 letters in the alphabet as measured by data collection and teacher observation. So this skill, teaching this skill to Eli, will facilitate improvement in his ability to read on grade level. So there's the outcome and we're going to teach him letter ID. If we have a student who is not reading on grade level, again, think about those examples. Maybe we focus on fluency. Maybe it's spelling that's impacting their ability. Maybe it's phonemic awareness. Think back to that previous slide that broke out several of those examples because you might need to focus on more than just letter ID for Eli. Let's think functional. I think that functional can be a little trickier than the academic piece. And when we review IEPs across the state, we do see this. We see that people have a harder time with the functional piece than the academic piece. So some examples of what we frequently see as outcome goals in the functional section would be increased attendance, increased work completion, decreased aggressions or biting, bolting, et cetera, increased safety or increased attention to task. We see these quite a bit. So let's take a look at Jane. So Jane is in the third grade and she's been identified with an OHI due to ADD. There are vows to support this. They are clearly documented in her IEP in section 4A and her IEP team worked together and identified the following skill deficit, and they wrote a how statement to accompany it. So we know that Jane has de deficits in her ability to self-initiate. And because of those deficits, her ability to maintain attention and complete assigned tasks is impacted. So again, we know that she has this very specific skill deficit around self-initiation, which impacts her ability to maintain attention and complete work, but we're not going to write a goal around completing work because we want all students to complete work, right? So we have our present level. Jane is demonstrating self-initiation skill deficits and can start work tasks within 12 minutes. 
Okay. So we're going to align that to the goal that immediately follows it. And we want Jane to demonstrate increased self-initiation -initi skills by starting work tasks within five minutes with less than two adult prompts and 80% of opportunities. So you can see that we've increased the rigor, right? We've moved from 12 minutes to five, which may require some adult prompts. And we've also had to change the percentage of mastery, which makes perfect sense in this situation. But again, we want Jane to complete work commensurate to her peers. So we are going to teach her self-initiation, which the team identified is a skill deficit in this case. Let's look at Nina. She's in first grade and has been identified with autism. Again, she's got a thousand and her team identified that she has deficits in her ability to request help which will impact her ability to engage socially with peers in ways that are not aggressive, okay? So as, as previously, she's been unable to reach this expectation of a day without aggressions. So we're going to write a goal around requesting help. So our present level looks like this. When prompted by an adult, Nina can pick up a help card, reach and release to a communicative partner, in 100% of opportunities. So we wanna move Nina to being a little bit more independent and have her work towards being able to independently pick up the help card, reach and release to a communicative partner in situations that require her to do so in 70% of opportunities. So again, we've moved the rigor, we've increased the rigor so that she's doing this without, without a prompt and she's going to do this more independently. Um, and we are going to teach her to do this and expect this to happen in, independent, in situations where she would naturally need help. There's her outcome. Nina is aggressive, right? We want her to be less aggressive. So we're gonna teach her to request help. And Louie, fourth grade, identified with emotional disturbance. He has evaluations in 4A and his team has identified that Louis has skill deficits in his ability to read and follow a schedule, which will impact his ability to attend school and participate in all daily activities across his day. So he can't read a schedule. He doesn't understand the schedule, so he can't attend. He's struggling to attend, but because we want all students to attend school, we're going to teach him a skill that will facilitate his ability to do that. So given his present level, which articulates when presented with a schedule that outlines activities, Louis can identify first then in 18% of opportunities. And we want to write a goal that aligns directly to that present level. So Louis will independently respond to a visual first then board by transitioning between two presented activities with 50% accuracy. So the hope would be for us to increase Louis's attendance by teaching him the first thin board. So it's important to remember to teach the skill that helps the student reach that outcome or age appropriate expectation and then write the goal around that skill. Do not write the goal around the expectation because that's what we want all students to be able to do. So you wanna really think about why can my student not reach this outcome, not perform or engage in this age appropriate expectation? What is the skill that is interfering with that and write the goal around that. So if a student has communication deficits, maybe you could help them by teaching them to request a preferred color or, or preferred size or shape. Maybe you need to teach them to request help or request a break. If the student is anxious, maybe they need to understand a first then board or some sort of presentation of non-preferred and preferred to help them deal with the anxiety, teach them calming activities. If they're impulsive, maybe a visual schedule or timer or some self-regulation tools would be helpful. If the student is struggling with organization, teach them to use a planner or to write a to-do list. And again, these are just possible examples. I'm sure that you all could come up with plenty others. 
One thing that is really important when you're thinking about data collection and progress monitoring, you really will still have to maintain data on that skill deficit for progress monitoring, right? So in this example, we're teaching the child to request help and you'd really have to have data around requesting help when it comes time to do your progress monitoring, right? But you might also have to maintain data on reduction of aggressions. So if we have a child who is aggressive and we're teaching them to request help in an effort to reduce those aggressions, which are age appropriate expectations, we want children not to be aggressive, right? Then you have to know whether or not teaching help is working. So if the aggression data does not decrease while you're teaching a child to request help, then requesting help is not working and you might need to teach another skill. Maybe it's take a break or maybe it's a schedule or you know other, many, many other things, but you will have to maintain data on both of those points to make sure that requesting help is impacting aggression. So we have some examples. So let's just take a look at these. We have a couple. So we have Margaret. And Margaret's present level indicates that she is demonstrating reading skills at the fourth grade level. The goal that immediately follows it and is aligned to that states that we want Margaret, given SDI by 9-17-22, to demonstrate reading skills at the fifth grade level as measured by data collection teacher observation work samples or similar. So what I want, I'm just going to pause here and I want you to take a look at this. And if I were on site with my team and we saw this, we would tell you that this is not compliant. We would say that this doesn't meet. Why would we tell you that? Take a minute and think about it. So the reason that this would not be compliant is that Margaret is in fifth grade. This is an age appropriate expectation for her, right? We want all fifth graders to read at the fifth grade level. That's what we want. And her present level is much too broad. The goal is not measurable because it's too broad. And there, there is no identification here of any specific skill deficits. So think back to Eli, right? Eli wasn't reading on grade level. So the team got together and they decided, you know, based on evaluations and observations and all of that information that it was, it was due to his letter ID. So Margaret, we're gonna look at her this way instead. So she demonstrates reading fluency of 37% when presented with a third grade reading passage. We want the goal to be aligned to that. So given SDI, Margaret will demonstrate reading fluency of 80% when presented with a third grade reading passage. So you can see we're moving her from 37% to 80%, and this will get her closer to that expectation of being able to read at the fifth grade level. Let's try another one. So we have Jeffrey. And Jeffrey's present level articulates that he demonstrates aggressive behavior 64% of his day. The goal that follows it says that Jeffrey will reduce aggressive behaviors to 15% of his day. So if we came on site, why would this not meet compliance? Take a second and just look at it and think about why this might not meet. So it's outcome-based, right? It's an age-appropriate expectation. We want all kids to come to school and be free from aggression. We would need to dig deeper and figure out what's the skill deficit for Jeffrey? Why is he aggressive? What is the skill that he is lacking that results in aggressive behaviors? So perhaps we need to teach Jeffrey to take a break. So if that were the case, when presented with situations that require Jeffrey to take a break before becoming aggressive, he will exchange the break card with a partner with 19% accuracy. That's his current present level of functioning. So we write a goal that aligns with that. When presented with situations that require him to take a break, he will independently exchange the break card with a partner 
with 50% accuracy as measured by teacher observation, data collection, and reduced aggressions. So this would be an example here where we are writing the goal around Jeffrey's ability to take a break, and we are going to maintain data on his ability to do that because we want to make sure he can get to 50% and use that information in progress monitoring. But you are also going to maintain data around reduced aggressions because you want to make sure that Jeffrey's learning to take a break results in decreased or reduced aggressions. It's really, really important to also remember that if you are providing and teaching supports to students that are help helping them to be successful, you want to really make sure that those tools are included in section six of the IEP. Because if your student goes out into the building with an ed tech or without an ed tech, and there's another teacher and they're trying to exchange a help card with that regular ed teacher, or they're in the lunchroom and they're requesting a break and they're trying to give the break card to somebody, you want those people to know what that student is doing, right? If a break card is something that helps the student to be successful and helps them to be able to take a break versus bolting or aggressions or something else, you want to honor that and you want the people who are around the student to know why it's important for them to honor it as well. And it's documenting it on the IEP is the way that you would do that. So we get this question a lot around related services and outcomes versus skill. And when you think about, for example, communication, we want all students to have appropriate communication skills. But if we have a student who doesn't, we're going to teach them, perhaps it's articulation, expressive language, receptive language. All of those will re re result in improved communication. So remember, you would not want to write goals around outcomes or age appropriate expectations because that's what all students should be able to do. Instead, you're going to use your team, you're going to use your data collection, and you're going to work to identify the skills that the student is missing that need to be taught to facilitate a change in that identified outcome. Those are those skill deficits. Oh, we already talked about this. This is a repeat slide. So again, thank you so much for joining me. We are very invested in receiving feedback from those of you who join us from the field. So if you would, please take a few minutes to give us some feedback. There is a QR code here on the slide. You can take a picture of that with your phone, which will link you directly to the document, or there is a link, whichever is easiest. And when you access the, the information, it's just a couple of questions. And we just would like to know whether, you know, how this, this PD worked for you and feel free to just answer those questions. And it will also give you the opportunity if you want contact hours for the time that you spent watching this, you can put in your email address and you will receive a contact hour. Make sure when you put in your email address, just double check the spelling because that's the only way we will have to get back in touch with you. So thank you again. We know that the field is working so exceptionally hard and we at the department are so proud to stand with all of you and um, as are your students. So thank you so much. I appreciate you joining us and please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any other questions or comments or other things you'd like us to consider. Thank you so much.